Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Paul Gergal. Paul, thanks for being here with me today. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you on the show. I've got to tell you congratulations for the new book that you have out in stores right now. It's titled Zero the Hero. Zero helps a curveball that wouldn't curve. So, Paul, can you tell me about the book? Sure thing. This is the third book in the series that I've written titled Zero the Hero. This book is Zero Helps a Curveball that Wouldn't Curve. Basically, the book is similar to the title in, in that the main character Zero helps his friend, who happens to play on a different team, helps him through his struggles with throwing a curveball properly. And Zero does his best to help him out. And a little bit of a surprise ending for Zero, but it all works out in the end. Hmm. Paul, is this a book you'd say would be good for kids, good for adults, or what kind of readers did you have in mind? It's a children's book. I do believe in the values that I talk about in the book. It's a story for anybody, Mm. but specifically children. I I think the best age is somewhere between five and eight years old. But really, the principles in the book, I, I strongly believe in them, and anybody, I think, can appreciate the value in the story. I try to do that, at least in all my books, where the values, I don't dumb down the values. I I speak to the children the way that I I would speak to anybody. And I do think the the values are universal and important for everybody. It's mainly written for sports enthusiasts, so any child that loves sports of any kind, Mm. baseball specifically, but any sport. I think the story is pretty universal. I understand that a lot of the inspiration behind this story was taken from things that were real-life experiences for you. Correct. So everything that I've learned with my son trying to help him with baseball, over 10 to 15 years of doing that with him, I've had all these little bits of inspiration over the years, which I've tried to compile in my head and try to get down on paper. These are amazing things that I've seen these kids do over the years and mainly true to life. The things that I write about, not word for word, but very closely mimic what I saw. I witness accounts of what I've, I've seen these children do over the years, and I just knew I had to get it down on paper, and I'm glad I did. Now, like you said, this is the third Zero the Hero book in your series. Do you have more planned? Yeah, so the fourth one is in my head right now. I'm, I'm, I'm jotting down some things on paper. Yeah, so the fourth one hopefully will be out fairly soon. (laughs) Fantastic. Paul, about how long does it take you to write the book, have the illustrations done, and then get it to press? So this is the third book I've written in basically three years. It's basically a a year process Mm -hmm. to get everything down and, and to work with the publisher and to get the illustrations as close to how I want them. Yeah, so it's about a year each book. Hmm. And what would you say is the most challenging part about the whole process for you? You know, I think trying to come up with the right illustrations per page, I think that's the most, that's been the most challenging for me. I'm pretty good. I can draw, the characters come from me, but it's, I'm, it's not my forte in life. I'm not great at illustration. So working with the real professionals to get that down, that's the hardest part in my experience. Paul, can you tell me about the feelings that you experience whenever you get that first physical copy in of the book you've been working on for like a year and you've just been seeing it up on the computer screen? You know, the first thing I think people think of is, you know, happiness or satisfaction. And and all that stuff is true. But in reality, the biggest thing I feel when I have the book in my hand and when I see it online, I have to be honest, it's a little bit of nervousness. How how do I get this book into people's hands? Mm. <laughs> That's what I think about mostly. I believe in these stories and I just I think it's important for children to kind of relate to these things. And you know, I, I could just think back on my own experiences growing up. You know, the best principles in life that I've learned obviously came from my parents, but they definitely were underlined by the books I read as kids. And the principles that I've learned in these books are still with me. So I try to do that in my books 
And so when I see the when I have the book in my hand, I'm like, okay, how do I get this book out to people? <laughs> how can I convince people to get this book? <laughs> Well, I really appreciate, I love the values in this book, and I think my listeners should definitely check it out. The title is Zero the Hero. Zero helps a curveball that wouldn't curve. It's written by Paul Gergal, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. Of course, you can grab it up anywhere, like in Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also down the street at your local bookshops. Well, Paul, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me about Zero the Hero. I really had a great time talking with you. I really appreciate it. It was fun. That was great. Thanks a lot. Sitting right next to me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Deborah Frank. Deborah, thank you for joining me here tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate you being here and got to congratulate you. You have a new book out in stores right now called Joy. The Journey is on You, Lessons from a Women's Ministry Teacher. So, Deborah, can you tell me what readers can find here? The book is about joy, and it's different scriptures on how we can find joy in our life. Hmm. Deborah, what kinds of readers were you thinking about when you were writing this? I was thinking about anyone who would like to find strength and joy in their life. And mostly the Christian world knows about joy, but sometimes we forget. So the book writing that I did was for every human being, saved and unsaved. Can you tell me about that moment, Deborah, whenever you got that first physical copy and you finally got to hold this thing that you created? That moment was very exciting because the memory of my deceased daughter popped in my mind because mm. she's the one that really, really gave me strength to do it. And Deborah, a lot of people out there listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out in things. And I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of writing and publishing your very first book. So do you have any words of wisdom, any sort of advice that you could give to new authors? Yes. For new authors, I would like to give you this advice. Follow your dream and keep it. Write it down. Make your vision plain to yourself and complete your task. Some good advice, Deborah. So it's obvious you have a lot of wisdom in you. You like to share that with people. Are you planning on maybe writing more in the future? Yes, I am. My book is geared toward Galatians 5 and 22, The Fruit of the Spirit. And Joy was the first one that I wrote the series on. And I plan on completing all eight on The Fruit of the Spirit. I'm now writing on love and peace at this present time. Fantastic. And when you look back over everything, all the work and time that you put into writing Joy, what's the most rewarding aspect for you now of being a published author? The most joy and, and the greatest aspect to me is that on this subject, uh, Joy, over four years ago, I ministered to a congregation. And at this present time, I did not know my daughter had breast cancer. She didn't even know it. Mm. And she walked up to me and she stated, Mom, you should put some of the wisdom and some of these things in writing. I said, well, nobody probably will publish me, but I'll try one day for the next month. She went to the hospital and she never came home. She had a pulmonary embolism and a massive heart attack. I'm sorry. And I started praying and asking God what to say. And he said, remember, you had joy during that time and keep your joy, even in spite of your trial and your tribulation, keep joy. And so when I wrote that, I was thinking about her and it inspired me to do it. Deborah, I love what you say here in the synopsis of the book. Right at the end, you said, as a friend once told me, it's all good and it's all God. What's that mean to you? It's all good. Although we go to transitions, tribulations and trials. We don't think it's good at the time, but it's all good. And we know if we are a believer that God has done it, no matter how we feel in our flesh, we know that the Lord has done it. It's all good. All things we know work together for the good of them who love the Lord and is called to his purpose. So it's all good. We can't see it sometimes, but it's all God. Well, I know this book is going to help and inspire a lot of readers. I encourage my listeners to go find this. Check it out. It's titled Joy, The Journey is on You, Lessons from a Women's Ministry Teacher. This is written by Deborah Frank and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
You can get this everywhere, of course, like on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Deborah, I really appreciate you sitting down with me tonight and telling me about joy and all the plans that you have coming up. I had a nice time talking tonight. Thank you, and you have a blessed night, and I appreciate you interviewing me. And I hope that on my next book, I'll have the same interview. Revelations, Unraveling Biblical Mysteries. This is a new book written by Larry Massa that says it solves some biblical puzzles. I'm really happy that Larry is joining me here right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about the book. Larry, thank you for joining me tonight. I appreciate talking to you. I appreciate you being here. Larry, can you tell me all about Revelations? What's in this book? Well, over the course of years that I have taught various Christian studies and classes and things like this, there's four or five things that persistently come up in the Bible that people can't really wrap their heads around, and they think there's contradictory or just couldn't happen. Hmm. So I explain away in this book those mysteries, if you will. So would you say then this is a book for church-going believers? Definitely for Christians and pre-Christians. About how long, Larry, did it take it to write this book and then put it through the publishing process? Actually, this book was pretty fast. Hmm. I have a website called crazyaboutgod.com, and on that, over the years, I have written blogs. And in those blogs, most of what is in this book were in those blogs. So all I really had to do is pull up the files and make them book readable, ready. That whole process was maybe five or six months. Hmm. Well, what sparked that inspiration to take your blog posts, to format them into a book, and then distribute it that way? Well, I am a local person who doesn't have a large outreach when it comes to anything audio. So what I decided to do is take those words, put them in a book, and hopefully get distribution far beyond my local area. Well, that's a great idea. So, Larry, what was it like after all that time working on the book that you finally got that hard copy in, that first physical copy, and you got to hold this thing that you created? What was that moment like? Well, it's the fifth time I've written a book, so it was not as dramatic as the first time. Mm. But, yeah, it, it, it felt good. You know, I was trying to do something for God, and there I had had in my hand a product that I hoped would glorify Him. Larry, a lot of people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out. They haven't published yet. Do you, do you have any advice that could get them rolling? Yeah, I'll start out with something that you're really passionate about. My advice is to write the book from front to finish before you start editing it because the the first draft is a love affair, and it's pouring out the love you have for that subject or that topic onto paper. Larry, you wrote this book pretty quickly, like you said, so it doesn't sound like you have a whole lot of trouble when it comes to writing. Do you ever get anything like writer's block? No, actually, I never have. My second book was a fiction, and it was the first time I had written fiction. And there was a couple of places where I didn't know how to progress the plot from where I was to where I wanted it to go. So if you call that writer's block, maybe, but I think what it really was is I just wasn't shuffling through the uh, options correctly at that point in time, and it came to me. Hmm. Is there something you do to get those ideas going when you're writing? Do you maybe get away from it? Do you maybe go get a cup of coffee, something like that? Yeah, actually, I never really write for a long period of time. After I retired from federal government, I ran a consulting firm, and it kept me very, very busy. So, you know, I usually had maybe two hours a day to write. If I got stuck, I didn't really interrupt myself. I just waited until the next day. Larry, something a lot of writers don't think about right away when they start writing a book is what it's going to look like, <laughs> what's going to be on the cover of this thing. So... How important is that to you? What kind of decisions did you make when it came to the cover? Well, it was very, very important. And in all five books that I created covers for, only one of those did I go to stock photograph on the Internet. All the rest of them, I basically came up with a design, and then the publisher had a design department, and they put together what I was trying to tell them with words and drawing, you know, stick figures. I know a lot of people are going to get questions answered, and they're going to glorify God as well with this book. It's titled Revelations, 
Unraveling Biblical Mysteries. It's written by Larry Massa. It's published by Christian Faith Publishing, and it's available everywhere, like at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Larry, thank you again for joining me tonight and telling me all about your work. I had a really nice time chatting with you. Well, it's my pleasure. I appreciate having this opportunity, and I thank you very much for your questions. Former bad boy for the New York Yankees, Louis Castillo, is joining me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Louis, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me, Reader House Podcast. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you being here and talking with me tonight. And It's super exciting because you have a book out called The Lucky Baseball. So, Lewis, can you give me a taste for what you've written about here? Oh, yeah. The the Lucky Baseball, it's an inspirational kids book for all the kids all around the world, not just baseball kids. It's a little bit of reality of my childhood growing up in the South Bronx, New York, how mean society could be looking to fit into society, looking for friends. And along my life's journey through a cartoon character, the baseball squeegee, who uh, Derek Jeter gave me the nickname, if people don't know who Derek Jeter is, the captain of the New York Yankees, who I got to work for as a bat boy. Wow. So I used the cartoon character to inspire kids that it's okay to go through ups and downs in life because you're going to have mentors like a Derek Jeter or David Cohn or someone from your communities that guide you into the positive roads and positive influences in life. Squeegee the Lucky Baseball is actually a mixture of reality with a little bit of imagination. Wow, sounds really great. Lewis, what was the inspiration that lit the spark for you to say, hey, i got to sit down and write this book and put it out there for the world? I actually sat down with David Cohn, who is a former Major League Baseball player and mm. My childhood idol and my best friend, so I ran by him and Dad was Strawberry, who also played baseball. They're good friends of mine wow. since I was a bat boy, and I ran it by them that I, I wanted to speak about them and their mentorship of what they guided me through life since the age of 15 till now, 40 years old, and what they did for me. Baseball and New York Yankees organization saved my life. So I just, this book was basically paying thank you to all those mentors, my mom as well, and Tina Lewis, the bleacher creature, the lady who got me the job of writing a letter to the Yankee organization. And all these people combined, I just wanted a live to give them their flowers and entwine my life story as well in it. Wow. Lewis, have you ever written a book before? Have you ever published? Yes, this is actually my second book. My hmm. first book was an adult's book called Clubhouse Confidential. It's not a a tell-all book. It's a book about my life experiences from 15 years old, and a lot of players pushed for it, like David Cohn, Jeter, Posada, you know, all the dynasty-era baseball players that I worked for during the dynasty from 1998 to 2005. Mm. It was just telling every relationship. It's 28 chapters, and I've written a chapter on each player that I had a relationship and a memory with. Hmm. and all these guys were proud of it, and it's just saying I was very fortunate and blessed with God giving me the opportunity to live out my dreams at a young age and travel to different states and do what I love to do, play baseball. Hmm. Lewis, I'm sure you have so many rich experiences and memories to draw on for this book, The Lucky Baseball. So did it take you a long time to put together and then publish? Good question. The book took me about a year. The Lucky Baseball, because I wanted to make sure that every interaction and for kids out there to understand that you're not alone and to get the message that it's okay and get families back together, parents and grandparents reading to their grandchildren or their children at home at least 30 minutes a day. That's my mission for this book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thanking everyone for their support. A lot of people on social media has been sending me pictures of their kids reading together with them. It's a beautiful experience. It's a motivational, inspirational story. took me a, a year to get everything into one. And I did a lot of rough drafts. Writing a book is not easy, but uh, mm-hmm. if you put your heart and passion into it, it could get done. And I recommend kids to write books and write their personal experiences. It's fun being an author. Absolutely, it is. <laughs> I know a lot of people are going to be inspired by this book. I encourage my listeners to check it out for sure. It's called The Lucky Baseball. It's written by Louis Castillo. And it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. Of course, you can grab this one up anywhere, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also down the street at your local bookshops. Well, Lewis, it's been wonderful having you on the show and chatting with you all about your work. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Reader's House, for having me. Thank you. God bless you, brother, and God bless everyone, and have a happy new year to all the listeners out there. 
Sitting down right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Harry Swanson. Harry, thanks for being here with me tonight. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. You have a new book out. This is fantastic. The title is Thomas Jefferson's Wee Little Book, Purified by Fire. Harry, can you tell me about this? Yes, it's a uh, revision and improvement on a work that Thomas Jefferson had completed back in 1820. It was a morals project where he was looking to basically improve his own life and walk. And what he did is he searched out to find the best moral teachings he could find. And he found them in the scriptures, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what he did is he went through and cut out all the teachings of Jesus. He then put them in time order and by topic. So he cut out about a total of 1,100 verses, put them in 81 categories, then put them in time order, then taped them into blank pages in order. And he used that as his own personal uh, nightly study. He referred to it as his uh, wee little book which is where I got the title from. And it was never published. It's not well known. And what I did is I went in and improved it in terms of I changed the version from the King James Version, which is a little tough for people to read today. Mm. And I put it into New International Version. Then I went in and added a commentary on every section just to give the reader more of an understanding of the scripture verses and the teaching itself. And I drew from the Matthew Henry commentaries to do that, which were popular in the de- in the time of Thomas Jefferson. It's a fantastic so, commentary. Correct. So that's it in a nutshell. It, it's a revision to the original, and it's much more suited for today, for today's reader. Hmm. Well, Harry, how did you get the idea to take this kind of a project on? I stumbled into it quite a number of years ago. I didn't know that his book, even it were his nightly study, existed. And I found it would be so much better today if it was revised and brought back. And I was kind of surprised that no one else had ever done that. Mm. On occasion, you'll see it referenced by authors, but no one's ever actually gone into the work itself and uh, redone it and brought it back. It's just, it's the greatest collection of moral teaching. It's designed by Jefferson to be rapid fire, meaning you can go through it and do quite a bit of headway each night as going through it, and then redo it again when you finish, start all over, which is what he did. He did it every night. Mm. How long of a process was this for you, Harry, once you started up until the time that it hit stores? Well, I did the bulk of it this year, but believe it or not, I started it back in around 1978, and I was almost doing what Jefferson did. This predates computers, so I was Xeroxing the pages of all the scriptures, putting them in order, and then writing the commentaries underneath it, and then just got lost. Uh, You know, life comes about, and uh, I put it aside up until earlier this year and went back to it and, you know, really worked on it pretty hard, putting in long hours and I'm kind of happy the way it turned out. It's what I wanted back 40 years ago, and clear and concise, and just sticking with what Jefferson wanted. He wanted something that was rapid fire, easy to read, no nonsense, and then you get it and move on to the next lesson. What was it like when the day came, you got the first hard copy in of this book, and you got to hold it, Harry? What was that like? Yeah, that was pretty exciting. Uh, After all these years, and it, it It takes a long time to put these things together and get it laid out properly and get all approvals and copyright and whatnot. So it's a lot of fun because you know the reader will benefit from it. It's Mm. it's not like a fictional book. You'll actually come along a long way as we're studying these scriptures. Mm. I think a lot of people are really going to benefit from this book, Harry, and my listeners should check it out. The title is Thomas Jefferson's Wee Little Book, Purified by Fire. It's written by Harry Swanson, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can get it everywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores, too. Harry, thank you again for joining me here tonight and telling me all about your work. I had a really nice time talking. Yeah, I appreciate your time, and thank you very much. This is the second book in a three-cookbook series by Chef Hunter Lee. It's called Living Large in Louisiana, a Southern Social Cookbook. 
I'm really happy that Chef Hunter Lee is right here with me now, and we get to talk all about this book. Hunter, thank you for joining me here again at the show. It's great to be back with you. Man, it's great to be talking with you again, and another book of recipes, something else that's making my stomach growl. So, Hunter, what can readers expect this time around? <clears throat> well, to be honest, with this second book, it has a lot of what we didn't put in the first. It is Living Large in Louisiana. It's a Southern social cookbook, and the reason being, this has all of our cocktail party recipes, a lot of my catering recipes that we did for our weddings and things like that, your appetizers, your little social bites. This also has all of my marinades, my sauces and dips. It has some great Southern drink recipes, and it has some tips, tricks, and do's and don'ts for entertaining like a true Southerner. Mm. And Hunter, you're quite the respected chef, so I'm looking at this and I might be a little bit daunted thinking that maybe these might be too complex for somebody like me, so do you have to be a master chef to get these things right? Absolutely not. Just like my first cookbook, these are easy to read, mm. they're easy to make, and for the most part, even with the changes in the world nowadays, all of these ingredients are pretty standard and easy to come by. I didn't want to make recipes or have recipes in the book that you would literally need me in your kitchen or another chef to cook. Mm. These are things that you can make yourself. These are things that I've made, some of them thousands and thousands of times. And of course, I, I mean, I do it without a recipe now. In fact, a lot of these, I actually had to make it so I could write it down because I didn't know the measurements. Mm. I just made it. These are things that anybody can do at home. You know, part of this is to be able to entertain and have guests over, socialize, and it not stress you out. Mm -hmm. It not be something that's so complicated that you spend two days in the kitchen trying to figure out my recipes or what you need to do. So there are a lot of cookbooks out there, a lot of Southern cookbooks, Louisiana cookbooks out there, Hunter. So I know this one is very different than all the rest. It is. It is considerably different. As with the first cookbook in my series, and actually probably more so in this one, it not only has the recipes, it also has the great South Louisiana and entertaining stories of how some of these recipes came to be, mm. why I used them in my career, or why they were important enough to me to put in a book. Some of them were stories from my childhood, my years of catering, and of course, the outlandish parties and all the craziness that went with it. Along with the recipes, you also get kind of a backstory, a very Southern backstory on a lot of them. I love it. You know, Hunter, you were talking before about how this is the first time you've written and published, and now you're into this series of cookbooks. And a lot of people listening right now are authors who are just starting out, and they don't even have a book out yet, but they're looking to do that. What have you learned along the way that maybe you could pass on to aspiring authors? Follow your dreams. And the publishing process can sometimes seem like it takes longer than the actual writing of the book. I have been happy for the most part with my publishers, but it was a new experience, and I didn't know what to expect. And to be honest, I mean, this is the second in that series. I put both of these books out within 18 months. Wow. Now, that's not to say that they weren't in the planning stages for quite a bit longer than that. Mm. But actual typing them out and submitting to publisher to the point that they are actually on shelves and online to purchase. It was, we ran through two in 18 months. We did the first one. It was a learning experience. We kind of went with that with the second one. We kind of knew what to expect. And I was actually going to hold the second one off for about a year. And I said, you know what? No, let's do it. And I did it, got it done. And it came out about Roughly about two or three weeks ago. Well, this is a book I know a lot of people are really going to be into. I encourage my listeners to check it out, definitely. It's called Living Large in Louisiana, a Southern Social Cookbook. It's written by Chef Hunter Lee and is published by Fulton Books. Grab it up everywhere like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and Google Play and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Chef, thank you so much again for joining me here at the show. I love talking with you every time. I hope we get to do it again soon. Well, it was great to talk to you as well. Lord knows that little bird friend of mine. It's the new book. It's in stores now, written by Mark Ira Krausman. And 
Mark is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about it. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Corey, for having me today. It's my pleasure. Mark, what can readers expect when they crack open Lord Knows That Little Bird Friend of Mine? You know, Corey, that's a good question. And what you get out of it is, in life, you know, you really can't do anything alone. Hmm. Of course, we all have a friend, we all have a neighbor, and this book is written in that direction. Mark, what kinds of readers did you have in mind when you were writing this? You know, the exciting part about writing is that, for me personally, as I speak about, of course, lessons that are learned. I'm 63 years old. But I really, truly write, I find, not intentionally, but of course, with your publisher, there's an age bracket. And I think this one goes from like from five to 12 or 13 years of age, 14. But really, it's it's good for anyone. All these lessons are here. Hmm. As the story unfolds, like many stories, Corey, what proceeds on that page, I try to find and look and been very successful in using scripture that supports what I write. Mm. Mark, can you tell me about the inspiration behind this? What gave you the idea to write it and publish this? This has been in the making for 52 years. I remember... Wow. Back in 1969, you know, that's back when you put your hand over your heart and everybody stood up and said, Pledge of Allegiance, you know. Mm. And it was spring of 1969. My language arts teacher gave the class an assignment, of course. But I was with the class asked to go home and write a short story. And I did, and I handed it back in. Two days later, uh, the teacher had handed all these papers out and said, who didn't get a paper back? And of course, I rose my hand, and she said, Mark, would you come up here, please? She says, Mark, is this your paper? And I said, yeah, come back behind here. And so I went behind the desk, and she wrote an A on the paper. And she whispered very softly, and I remember she said, Mark, do you think you would like to be a writer when you grow up? And of course, you know, you say, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that has carried me all this time. Mm. And now I have arrived, I think, and I'm very, very blessed to be here. And on this book, Lord knows that little bird friend of mine, my mother saved everything. And through my mom and dad, I was able to go out into my garage, and there it was in pristine condition. And it's in this book in the back for you know all the mothers in the world who save things for other children. And you know, let's not forget about you know those devoted dads out there. So. Outside the story, which I had written, in the back is a gift from me from my mother who saved everything. And that's the story I had written in 1969. Wow. Mark, what was that day like when it finally came in? You finally got the first hard copy of this book and you got to hold this thing you've been working on and it is really your life's work. <laughs> well, that's another story in itself. The box comes to your doorstep and it's from your publisher. And I owned it up. and. It was from a woman in Alaska who wrote a beautiful story. My book got mixed up with hers. Oh, no. And uh, eventually, <laughs> but it was such a beautiful story. But there's people like myself out there. And I eventually had gotten mine. And, of course, you know, it is a dream come true because you have worked so hard. You know, you mm. search your heart with all you have. And uh, when it finally comes to light, it's just the most wonderful feeling. So many readers are going to be blessed by this book. I encourage my listeners to check it out. The title is Lord Knows That Little Bird Friend of Mine. It's written by Mark Ira Krausman, and it's published by Covenant Books. You can get it everywhere, of course, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also at traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Mark, thank you again for joining me here at the show and telling me your story, telling me about your book and everything you've got coming up. I really enjoyed our time tonight. You know, I thank you so much. I'm very blessed to be sitting here with you today. And I do hope that I am an inspiration. And I do hope that, you know, what I believe, I believe is good works. And I ask for many to go out and see what I do, because it does come from the heart within. And I thank you very much for having me today. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author psalmist Cheryl A. Boone. Cheryl, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. I am very, very glad to be here with you this evening. 
Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad that you're here with me this evening. So, Cheryl, you have a new book out titled Be Encouraged. What's this one all about? Yes, my book called Be Encouraged. It's about encouraging others not to give up on their dreams, to be determined to keep going. And when life is going or not going your way, that is going to be a brighter day. Mm. And this is a book of prophetic poetry. Can you go into that? Yes, it is a book of prophetic poetry. And when I say prophetic poetry, I use the word prophetic for the simple fact that these are poems that came straight from God, came out of me being in prayer. And after that, God would speak to my heart and begin to give me things to write down. And and with that, I would start writing. And that's why I call it prophetic poetry. Hmm. So you're getting all these poems, you're writing them down. And what made you decide, I'm going to collect these things, I'm going to put them in a book and publish this for the world? Well, what made me do it? It was during COVID, you know, when we were all shut in Mm. and we had no way out and nowhere to go. And in my private time, spending with God, God told me to write a book. And at that time, I did not believe that I really could write, you know, as, as far as being an author. I didn't see that. But the Lord encouraged me to write. And from that point, I went on ahead and I started writing. Hmm. Now, people who are in the church, the believers, are going to get a lot from this. Cheryl, what about the unbelievers? Is this something for them as well? Oh, definitely. Definitely, I would say it's not just for believers. It's for anyone who wants to be encouraged. Hmm. It's for anyone who needs to understand their work. It's for anyone who needs to know to be determined for whatever it is for their dream, you know, and not to give up on what it is that they feel in their heart that they're actually called to do. Now, before Be Encouraged, Cheryl, have you ever written or been published before? Yes, I have. I published a book. My first book actually was another book of poetry. It's called Poems from the Heart. And I also have collaborated with a couple of other authors, and I'm a co-author in about three other books. Fantastic. Does that feeling ever get old for you then, Cheryl, whenever the first physical copy finally comes in the mail and you get to actually hold this thing you've been working on for so long? (laughs) No, it never gets old. Mm. I am very excited (laughs) about every time a new book comes out. Because the whole thing is, is that I'm excited because I feel the writings of my poetry or even my short stories and the other books that I co-author in, it's there to help people. And as long as I know I can help other people in my writing, it's never going to get old. Mm. I get a feeling you got a lot more in you, Cheryl. Have you thought about what's next, (laughs) about what you're writing and publishing? You know what? Actually, yes. My next book that I would like to do is a children's book, Hmm. and I would like it to be an audio book. I'm still working on it, but it's called It's a Brand New Day. And what that book is basically about is getting children to start their day off with Jesus, Hmm. because we always tell them about, okay, we say our prayers before we go to sleep, but how about let's teaching our children to wake up and start their day with the Lord. Oh, it's a fantastic idea. Now, Cheryl, so many people listening to us right now are authors just starting out. You know, they haven't written or published anything yet, but they feel like they are going to. Do you have any advice that you could offer them? Yes. The advice that I would give to those authors who have not yet discovered the fact that they are authors is just keep on writing. Because more than likely, you already started jotting things down. Know that what you're jotting down is important. Know that it is there, not just for you. Because when we get it, it starts with us first, but it's, it also goes out to reach others. So I would say, don't give up. Don't give in. Keep on writing until you win. Well, if you're looking for inspiration, if you're looking for godly instruction, then check out this book. It's titled, Be Encouraged. It's written by Psalmist Cheryl A. Boone and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. And you can get it everywhere, like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores as well. Well, Cheryl, thank you for coming on the show and sharing the book and your heart. I had a really nice time talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it so much. God bless you. Book of Keys 2, written and referenced by a man returning to the child's faith. 
That's the name of the new book. It's out in stores right now, written by Zachary Zolkowski. I'm really happy that Zachary is talking with me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Zachary, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Zachary, can you tell me all about what's in the Book of Keys 2? Well, it's a testimony about the power and mercy of Jesus Christ. The book contains theology. It has a little bit of eschatology. And it's really centered around the concept of human vengeance and how to give that up. Hmm. Zachary, what kinds of readers do you think would really be into this? Christians who are trying to fortify their faith and maybe uh, read another work by another Christian, just to kind of strengthen their faith and maybe even challenge it a little bit. Maybe people believe in a certain way, but they'd like to know what other people believe. And I think that it's really important that Christians have study materials available. So that's kind of my target reader, but also individuals who are kind of lost and looking for some source of hope. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a little bit of vengeance in their life against other people, and maybe their life is just kind of spinning in a circle, and maybe they just want to find a pathway to a real source of hope. And this book is very much so for them as well. Mm. Well, Zachary, I'm curious, how'd you get the idea to write this? What sparked you? Oh, it was shortly after I finished the first book and had it published. I had a little bit more I'd like to write down, and it just led to a whole series of thoughts. To be honest with you, I wrote the first one. It was just completely random. But by the end of it, I really think that Jesus helped me write it and get it into a workable concept. And I just basically mimicked the concept of the first book into the second one, and it turned out really good. Hmm. It's really interesting to me you say the child's faith. What's the child's faith? Well, the child's faith is actually the answer to vengeance. It's kind of difficult to explain, but we as adults, we think totally differently than a child would think. Mm. But at the same time, Jesus is trying to lead us back into the simplicity of how a child thinks to have that kind of faith. Because we, we as adults, everything we see, we're pushed and pulled around like the wind. And Jesus was trying to bring us back into the boat to have that peace and that calm in the storm. And when you get that first copy in, that physical copy in after all that time, Zachary, what's that moment like when you finally get to hold this thing you created? Oh, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's just, it's an overwhelming experience that you were able to get something together. I had a fantastic editing crew with Christian Faith Publishing. Mm. They're really easy to work with, and just holding that book for the first time, it's an amazing experience. Mm. Have you thought about maybe writing more and publishing more after this? Absolutely. I have a couple chapters done in the third book of the series, and maybe after the third book I might switch it up. I got a few more book ideas, but I'm definitely interested in continuing writing. So. You know, going through the writing and publishing of books, you learn an awful lot along that journey, Zachary. I'm sure you know that as well as anybody. Do you have any advice now that you could offer to those listening who are just starting out in this whole thing? Absolutely. Don't give up. That's the worst mm -hmm. thing you could do. Pray fervently for help and insight in what you're trying to do and put your heart, soul, might, and mind into your book. The only thing I would say is don't try to be perfect. Let God be perfect, because if you go down the road of perfection, it just it eats you up. But if you put your heart, soul, might, and mind into a book, writing it out, putting it all together, you're going to do very well. Zachary, do you ever get something like writer's block? And then how do you get through a roadblock like that? <laughs> definitely, definitely get writer's block. But what what I find for myself with writing books is sometimes I just needed some time off of writing and just kind of within the Christian life, there's a lot of meditating, a lot of thinking, a lot of question asking, a lot of looking for insight within other Christians. And maybe even the world would give you some insight because the Bible is about good and evil. It's a lot of everything coming together at the right time. Mm. Well, this book is surely going to encourage and inspire a lot of people. It's titled, Book of Keys 2, written and referenced by a man returning to the child's faith. It's written by Zachary Zolkowski and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. And of course, you can get it everywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes and traditional brick-and-mortar stores as well. Well, Zachary, thanks again for coming on the show here and, and telling me about your work. I had a really great time talking. Yep, thank you very much. To God be the glory.
Author Linwood Batts is joining me right here now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Linwood, thank you for being here with me tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you on the show, and I just wanted to say congratulations. You have a new book out titled Lion Leadership Mentality. So, Linwood, what are readers in store for with this? Well, they're they're in store to explore a bit more about passion, purpose, and vision. I'm taking the lion attitude and adding biblical principles along with industry standard leadership quality so that the reader can have all three perspectives as they're reading the material. Hmm. Were you writing for church leadership primarily? Well, it is, uh, yes, church leadership, too. But what I found in doing some leadership conferences in most recently, there are also some teams get really get excited about passion, purpose, and vision, mm. but also leaders in corporate America that are Christians that are leading you know, people in that work environment. So I'm finding that there is a little bit of everybody that it touches. Linwood, what lit the fire for you about this? What gave you the idea to write the book, and then you have to sit down and get started on it? Well, you know, I, you know, as I'm also a pastor, so that means that I write anyway. But one of my uh, inspirations is my daughter. She's my first editor. She reads everything that I write. So, <laughs> you know, she goes, Dad, just go on and write because you write the, such that people will understand it. And it's simple enough so that even the youngest child can, can grab it. But that was kind of my inspiration. You know, my, my wife and kids support me with that as well. So it, it makes it a little bit easier when you enjoy writing. Hmm. Is this your first time then venturing into the realm of publishing? No, actually, this is my second book. Hmm. I wrote another one, oh, back in 08, I believe it was, just a little short book that is now out of production. But uh, that was my first one. This is my second one. Does this whole thing take you a long time to do, both the writing and then all that publishing process? Well, the writing, yes, because it's the detail of me writing it and think it's right, and my daughter reading it, and she says it's right. And when you get to the publisher, then they got to look at it, and they have to read it as well. Mm. So <laughs> it, could, it probably took me a year to put it together, and then another six months to go through the publishing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about a good year and a half to finish a project, uh, you know, or longer, right? Depends on how long you're writing. Yeah, a lot of time and work goes into this kind of thing. So what was it like when you finally got that first physical copy and you got to hold this thing in your hands? <laughs> well, that that was like, you know, that was awesome, you know, mm. to get the book in my hand, which says there was a finished work. And, you know, it's like I said, well, the Lord, the Lord finished what he started, if you would. So it's just like really exciting to get that in my hand. And then, you know, even more is when somebody else has read it and they go, hey, I've read it twice because wow. I wanted to make sure I got everything. So. It just makes my eyes light up, my heart warm from the joy of it. Do you think we'll see more from you in the future when it comes to writing and publishing? Yes, absolutely. I'm already thinking about the next book that's going to be a sequel to this one. Hmm. You know, so I'm starting to do some research and grab some information about how I want to pull that one together. It's going to be a little bit different, I think, but it's, it's, it's going to kick off from the lion mentality and uh, just grow from there. Linwood, there are a lot of aspiring authors listening to us right now. What's your best advice you could give them? What I would tell them, because I had had an, uh, someone ask me that recently, you know, how do you get started? I said, really just start writing, right? Just get it out of your head and get it on paper and just let it flow. And, you know, don't worry about the organization yet, but the more you write, all of that's going to come together with the outline. So that's my message. Just start writing. Just let it flow and, and have fun doing it. Hmm. What did you find the most challenging part of the publishing process once you got done writing it, but now there's a lot more work to be done? Well, I think that was, you know, I had to reread. How many times have I read my own book, right? <laughs> I thought I knew it. <laughs> you know, so I had to read it again and edit it and send it back. And then they, they, I had to read it because they had changes, so I had to read again. And I think that was it. It's like that third time is like, I've read it three times already. Do I want to read it again? <laughs> but I have to read because I could have missed something as well. So it's that constant reading and understanding and going back and forth to the publisher, which they do tell you. They say, we're going to go back and forth many times because we want to get it right. And I agree with that. I'd really appreciate them for doing that. Well, I know readers will be blessed by this book and should definitely check it out. The title is Lion Leadership Mentality. It's written by Linwood Batts, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. Of course, you can find it everywhere, like at Amazon or at Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Linwood, thanks again for coming on the show and chatting with me all about your book. I had a nice time talking. You're welcome. Thank you so very much. Enjoyed chatting with you as well. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.